This very short vodcast is going to go into the background of what are ionic compounds and how do they form. We will then do another review vodcast on how to write their names and write the formulas for ionic compounds and then spend a little bit of time examining metallic compounds. So let's begin. So why do compounds form in the first place? Or why do molecules perhaps form? They form chemical bonds to achieve stability. And they want to be isoelectronic. That means the same electron configuration as the nearest noble gas. I think I would take exception to that statement, every element wants to be inert. I wouldn't say inert. I would say every element wants to be more stable, like the inert or noble gases. And of course you know that you get stable as an atom by having the outermost valence electrons filled up with eight valence electrons. Unless, of course, you're helium, which is stable with two. Sorry for the humor. They want to be inert, not a nerd. This is Miss Hackworth's humor, not mine. Okay, quickly moving on. Why do atoms form bonds? Well, let's first define what a chemical bond is. It's a strong attractive force between atoms or ions in a compound. Now, we're going to focus on ionic compounds in this chapter and covalent compounds in the next chapter, but let's take a look at how one can reach that stability goal. Now, in the universe, everything likes to flow downhill. You don't want to be in a high energy state. You want to be chilling in a low energy state. And so to do that, you might have to cause bonds to break or bonds to form. Now, there's something called bond energy, which we will study in greater detail at a later date. But it's the energy that's involved in the process of either forming a bond, where energy is released, or breaking a bond when energy is required. But the most important thing to get out of this is whether you're talking about ionic bonding, where there is a transfer of electrons, or covalent bonding, where there is a sharing of electrons, it's the outermost or valence electrons that are ones that are involved in the process. So here's a picture of argon, which of course is a noble gas. Where would its valence electrons be? Of course, there would be eight of them, because it's in Roman numeral column six. And as you can see down here, two of them at their third energy level, orbiting in a region of space roughly like a sphere. And six more of them are in those p or dumbbell orbitals, also found at the third energy level, but a little farther from the nucleus. So two plus six is eight. And if you notice on this Bohr model of the atom, which of course doesn't look this way, you can see that its highest energy level is this outermost ring in which there are eight electrons. So there's a way you can represent valence electrons, and I have to apologize on the PowerPoint here because some of the formatting is coming out a little funky. They're called electron dot structures. And to be able to do this, it's very simple. You just find the um, element uh, by locating it on the periodic table. You can write its electron configuration, which would be the same number of electrons as the atomic number, as long as it's a neutral atom. And what we want to focus on, though, are just the valence electrons. So if you focus more on columns Roman numeral 1 through 8a, it's a little bit more obvious than trying to deal with some of the exceptions that you can find in the transition elements. So let's really just show you how simple it is. You write the symbol for the element, and then you put dots around it, and the dots are one dot for each valence electron. Again, I would probably take exception with this, where it says put your s orbital electrons on one side and your p orbitals on the remaining sides. Don't do that. Just put dots down. It's, it's not important and it won't teach you the concept that you need to know. So let's try some of these examples. And to be able to do this, you're going to need a periodic table in front of you because you have to see what column those elements belong in. So if I was looking at the element lithium, it's in Roman numeral column one. It has one valence electron. End of story. That's it. Now, you could have put the dot instead of here. You could put it on the left. You could have put it on the bottom. You could have put it on the right. Doesn't matter. Lithium, one valence electron. We're done. When you do the element boron, again, notice we're only talking about the valence electrons. The element boron 
has three valence electrons, and I would again take exception with this. I would not pair these two together. I'd put them top, right, bottom, or maybe left, right, bottom. Don't pair them together because even though they are S electrons and belong in their same S sublevel, it's not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to demonstrate covalent bonding by adhering to these rules. So don't do it that way. Just put the dots down around the atom. The valence electrons are represented by dots. And kind of do the Hunge rule thing. I maybe go, since I'm a top to bottom person and from a left to right person, I would just go top, left, bottom, right, and then I'd come back and double up if I have enough electrons. So for example, if I was doing nitrogen, I'd put one here, and then I wouldn't pair it up, but I would have put one there, one there, one there, and then I would have come back and put the fifth electron here. So nitrogen's in Roman numeral column five, that's why it has five valence electrons. Fluorine's in Roman numeral column seven. Following the same rules, I wouldn't have paired up immediately. I would have gone one, two, three, four, five. That would be the fifth one here. And then six, and then seven, since it's in Roman numeral seven. Beryllium's pretty easy, but again, don't pair them up at the top like this picture is going to show. I'd put one on the left or one on the right. It's in Roman numeral column two and therefore it has two valence electrons. You could have put one on the top and one on the bottom. The location is pretty much irrelevant. Carbon, the basis for all life as we know it, and planet Earth anyways, is in Roman numeral column four, and having those four valence electrons, as you see there, make it able to do very special kinds of bonding that helps form the backbone or uh, skeletal structure, if you will, of molecules that make up living things. Here's where the formatting gets pretty messed up. So if I'm looking at Roman numeral column six, which is oxygen, boy, is that totally messed up. I would have six valence electrons around oxygen, and there'd be two singletons and two pairs. And finally, of course, in this one, the formatting is way messed up. You would have eight valence electrons, but I would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Make sure you put that neon in the center, unlike what it shows on your screen. So those are what we call electron dot structures. They're very simple to do. Look at the column the element is in. On the Roman numerals 1 through 8a, the number of dots you put around them is equal to the number at the top of the column. Okay, now elements are always trying to achieve a stable octet, and the rule we're going to use now for that is called, it's the octet rule. Now there are exceptions, but for right now I'm going to pretend this is a hard and fast rule. So unless you're helium or hydrogen, which are very small atoms and only have room for one or two electrons uh, and, at all, then you have to have eight valence electrons around your various elements. Okay, I think I'm going to just introduce ionic bonding here and then we'll pick up on the naming of ionic compounds after I explain what ionic bonding is. So the most important thing besides remembering its valence electrons is that in ionic bonding there's electron transfer. So for example, the element sodium has 11 electrons, only one valence electrons. If it was to lose that electron to chlorine, who has seven in its outermost energy level, everybody would be happy because it would transform from sodium, the unstable atom, into sodium, the stable ion. And if you notice here, by losing that outermost electron, the remaining energy level has eight valence electrons. And that's the whole goal. Over on the right-hand side, the chlorine, which was unstable with seven valence electrons, with this additional electron now believes that it has eight. So each of them have achieved the stability of the nearest noble gas, but now something unusual has happened. Losing electrons makes you positive. Losing negativity makes a positive ion. <clears throat> and that electron that it lost, of course, was its one valence electron in an S orbital at the third energy level. And over here on the right-hand side, 
not so critical over there. It says 3s2, but it, you basically gained an electron to make your total number of valence electrons 8. I wouldn't pay much attention to that. So it starts off with 7, 3p5, 3s2, 2 plus 5 is 7, but with the addition of the electron down here, now it will have 8. So now we're at the situation, as I started to say, with full octets. Except you still have the same number of protons in the sodium. You've lost one electron. And if you add a positive 11 to a negative 10, you get a net charge of 1 plus. It's now become a cation, a positively charged ion. The chlorine became chloride, the names of negative anions have an ide ending to them when they're single atoms by themselves. And so now the chloride still has its original 17 protons, but with an extra electron has a net negative 1 charge, or 1 minus if we were to write that. So of course you know opposites attract. The plus 1 sodium cation is attracted to the 1 minus negative anion of chloride, and we call that an ionic bond. It occurs because electrons transfer and they attract to each other because opposites attract. The formal word for that is electrostatic attraction. So what we will do in the next section is to study how you write the names and the formulas for ionic compounds. Until that time.